Hey y'all, you are going to love this conversation. I was listening through it just a few minutes ago and was smiling and laughing along the whole time. Which is kind of a feat since the topic of this episode is climate change and my mind usually goes to a dark place when I'm thinking about that subject. So big credit goes out to our guest, Dr. Spencer Scott, for radiating climate optimism during our conversation and for painting a picture of a more regenerative and equitable future that is worth fighting for and worth hoping for. Well, hey everyone, Uh, we are back for another episode of Bottomless Coffee, and today we're going to talk about climate futurism, working title, We'll see. I'm pretty sure that that's going to be the vibe of today's episode. And uh, we're going to take an approach that I am less familiar with, but that my guest seems to be more familiar with. And we're going to be optimistic uh, <laughs> when in talking about climate change. <laughs> you know, often it's a lot of doom and gloom and uh, 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, everything's melting. The polar bell, the polar bears may or may not get their Coke this Christmas. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I'm here uh, with a uh, bi- biologist, writer, activist, and maybe or maybe not a farmer, Spencer Scott. How are you, Spencer? Hello. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, oh, uh, jury, jury's still out on the farmer. We'll yeah, see. yeah, and I'm gonna. I'm, I mean, hopefully, I don't spend my entire hour with you uh, just asking about farming. But when I was doing my research, which is code for creeping on your various Instagrams, <laughs> <laughs> I saw that you have a solar punk farm. Solar punk farms. Yeah, my partner and I started um, a aspiring farm a year and a half ago. Um, hoping to do some land stewardship and some soil regeneration. And so, yeah, this yeah. is a, a project we've we've embarked on. So this is, um, one, it's a beautiful project that I think a lot of us are going to be really interested in. Uh, and so maybe uh, if, if optimism turns out to be too difficult of a conversation yeah. to have, <laughs> <laughs> then we can talk about farming. Perfect, um, pivot. But, in the podcast so far, this is like episode maybe 23-ish, mm-hmm. and we've had kind of a general conversation about about climate change. We've alluded to um, climate activism in the form of becoming like an activist investor, like mm-hmm. forcing Exxon to do better. Yeah. Um, we've certainly talked about uh, carbon footprint, but we haven't really talked about, um, you know, changing your whole life, starting a farm. Uh, wearing overalls. And so (laughs) we'll see, we'll see. Now, uh, how did you come to sustainability? Was it through your biology or? Yeah, yeah, Um, that I, it's very much been a thread throughout my whole life. Um, I entered undergrad actually wanting to be a sustainable architect or a green architect as I knew it back then. Um, And kind of, I think what I found out after taking physics was that I really loved the biology side (laughs) and wasn't ready to be a structural engineer. Um, But yeah, so that ended up, I ended up studying bioengineering and that's what I got my PhD in. Hmm. Um, And so throughout that whole trajectory was a concentration on biology, a lot of microbiology, bacteria and, and, and small, small organisms. But that just kind of led me to be fascinated by life in general. Um, And so I think that's where it started. Um, And then it really took shape after the 2018 IPCC report. And I was like, ooh, yeah, this is, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) this is something that maybe more people should be working on. Um, And so it was both like a combination of I had a genuine interest and thought this was a really important topic, environmentalism and and climate change. And I also felt like I could work on things that would make me feel happy and fulfilled um, in the climate space, you know, expressing my creativity through writing um, while like keeping an eye toward science and, um, and those things. So, yeah. 
So the 2018 IPCC report yeah. uh, kind of spurred you to change careers. Yes. Uh, did the 2021 <laughs> report Buried caused you to lose your hair? <laughs> yeah. Or <laughs> I know. I know at that point I was just kind of like, yeah, I'd, I'd seen this like freight train coming our way at, by the time that one came out. But it's always like interesting to watch how every year more and more people get involved. And like, you know, there yeah. were people that have been involved decades and decades before I saw that 2018 yeah. report, you know? And so I'm, there's so many people there that, that will look at me and be like, I am a late comer, <laughs> you know, to this. Um, uh, I mean, I think I'm certainly a later comer to this than you are. Um, when I was growing up in the Atlanta area, I thought mm -hmm. that I was an environmentalist because I recycled, you know? Yeah. I was like, I'm going to put everything into the blue bin and that makes yeah. me an environmentalist. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so wrong. Um, and yeah. I've come a little bit farther down the path. Wonderful. And mm -hmm. um, ugh, not to make this too personal, but I do have a question that you might be uniquely suited to answer as a biologist okay. and an environmentalist. Yes. Uh, in this time of COVID-19, mm -hmm. uh, when I'm wearing a lot of masks, yep. <laughs> um, how often am I allowed to wear the same mask over and over Because <laughs> I don't want to uh, make waste, you know? I, I know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know the specific answer of how many times, but <laughs> okay. I personally, I, I was actually did like a little bit of research on this. And oh, I, thank um, you. just because I have a... A reusable mask, um, mm -hmm. and like a cloth it's made one. out. Of, yeah, it's a cloth one from my favorite company. They're called the Sway Sew Shop. Um, they're amazing for so many reasons. They're like sustainable, fair wage focused, and like community oriented. Yeah, and um, they have like a little filter pouch. So like, I think you're supposed to put in a secondary filter. Okay, but okay. Um, I don't know. I think there's just that trade off in I when I worked in like biomedical research, like you create so much waste to be sterile. Um, and I think it's just such a tough intersection of sustainability and public health to be like, right now, I think our best solution is to be kind of wasteful if you're, if you're trying mm -hmm. to follow best practices. Um, but personally, I try to use a reusable mask as much as possible. And then when I may be going to like a high exposure area, like uh, we're going home for the holidays um, and I'm going to get an N95 mask, like disposable yeah. mask. I'll probably wear it until it's gross, but. <laughs> okay. Okay. This yeah. is good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is better advice than I was finding when I was Googling. So Great. I appreciate Great. it. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No problem. Um, now we come to the hard part of this conversation, mm -hmm. which is talking about optimism. Um. In our emails, uh, one thing uh, that you wrote really stuck out at me, it's in conversations about climate change, we really shouldn't view climate change as a sacrifice. And I think maybe from the policy perspective, which is how I approach a lot of things, mm -hmm. it's, um, I've seen or I've viewed climate change as that kind of a shifting of resources, like yeah. take resources away from here and put them over here so we can address this problem. Or, you know, if you are a consumer, stop consuming so much, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you take a different perspective and I'm interested in hearing more. Yeah. I mean, my perspective comes from both experience and, you know, like reading a lot about how behavior change happens. And I think ultimately no matter you know how much we want to do the right thing it's hard if you if you're looking at something as a sacrifice to do it consistently hmm. and i think what is maybe better suited to make change is to like change our mindset about what we're doing and why we're doing it and so what what i kind of focus on and what we focus on at solar punk farms which we can get to later um, is is building a narrative around climate action being uh, a fulfilling action that you partake in in, a, in in an effort to create like a more joyful or more equitable, a more pur purposeful future. Um, and so, yeah, I think that there's something, 
the moment you start associating harm with certain things, um, it becomes less enjoyable to partake in them, you know? And yeah. so if you can, if you can see the full picture, it, it will just, you'll be like, well, I don't want to do that anymore. Now that I know that there's all of these things wrong with it. Um, uh, sure. Yeah. And so then what you were saying, like, okay, we're shifting resources to, to be like, oh, okay, we know that this is bad. Let's shift resources towards something that is good. Yeah. And then we can feel good about doing those things. Um, so I think that ultimately, I think though, if we keep talking about um, addressing climate change as like all of these things we have to sacrifice, all of these things we have to give up, we need to be focusing on all of the things that we stand to gain um, and all of the ways in which our lives will improve. So okay. yeah, that's kind of my, my work in theory. That's good work. Like I'll buy it. Yeah. Um, sure. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're describing it and I'm kind of like, oh, this is like how um, in uh, public health spaces, we talk about maybe not dieting, but mm -hmm. changing your lifestyle. Because if, you, yeah. if you're talking about dieting, it's like no cookies, no cakes, yeah. no mochas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, all of those things in my mind are chocolate related. No chocolate, <laughs> no chocolate cake, no chocolate mochas. That's the best, <laughs> best things to have. Yeah, but you, you live uh, a healthy lifestyle. You plant, your, plant and eat your own carrots. I don't know what you yeah. plant, maybe carrots. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you get to live a long, fulfilling, healthy life. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of the attractive thing that you get in lieu of uh, this other attractive thing. Yeah. So yeah. maybe and instead of, oh, go, you, why don't you go ahead? These people no, hear me talk no. all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think that's a, the dieting thing is a great analogy. And I mean, just to give some like real examples, I think a lot about how we organize our cities and our transportation. And like, for instance, the world without um internal combustion engines like uh, the normal cars we're used to mm -hmm. will have like way less air pollution which is like a global insane yeah. killer of humans and um we'll have to wait in traffic less <laughs> like if we invested in electric public transit like our lives would be measurably better in so many different ways um and i and i think that's true also of like how we organize cities there's this kind of movement in urban design to be more towards like a 15 minute city where you can like bike or walk yeah. to anything in your neighborhood within 15 minutes. And like, that would be so much more enjoyable to live in. And, you know, there's so many older European towns that were built around humans and maybe a push cart um, that people love going to because of that aspect um, where it's like, it's so enjoyable to walk around. There's all these shops, there's all these things to see. It really feels like, oh, this was built for me, a human, instead of most American cities feel like they were built for cars because they were. They were. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think communicating and that way, like there's a lot of things wrong right now that if we solve them, happen to also be solving climate change. And like, so let's make it better. Let's make it better. Um, yeah. I think for, I'm like addressing the audience, for more insights on yeah. city planning. <laughs> we had um, a city planner come on and talk about um, his experience growing up, I wanna say in like the panhandle of Florida or something, and okay. like everyone needed a car um, in order yeah. just, just to get around. And then he studied abroad in Europe and was like, wait a minute, this mm -hmm. is so much better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so maybe going back to the diet, healthy living thought, maybe we need a way to show people just how much better the future really can be. The present can actually be if yeah. we just do things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was one like meme that I love so much that was like one of the things people probably didn't realize they loved most about college was that they lived in like a walkable city. And ah. it, and like, I don't know if every college campus is the same, but like, I'm sure there's a lots where you need to like drive around in a car, but a lot of college campuses are built to be walkable. Yeah. And that's college why- College towns. Yeah. College towns. And it's like, that's kind of why we love them. <laughs> I do love One that. of the reasons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, food for thought. You know, my, my mind actually immediately went to food and thinking about college towns. I went to the University of Georgia for law school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, there was this place called Pita Pit. And at yeah. three o'clock in the morning after, you know, <laughs> studying really hard. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Sure. 
I could go and wait in line with some peers and get one. And that's really interesting because, um, mm-hmm. interesting to me anyway, because yeah. part of what you were saying earlier with regard to climate optimism is that uh, our future can be more joyful. Mm-hmm. And when I think about how much joy there really was in those, um, those kind of silly moments, right? Where I, I, I really could just kind of roll out of bed or roll out of whatever fine establishment I was in and just walk yeah. right over to the pita pit and then walk home. Um, that's really wonderful. Now yeah. that is in stark opposition right now to how I was thinking about it when you wrote that because mm. I said, hey, what's the last time anyone thought of humans as joyful? <laughs> <laughs> I just know, describe I humanity. Was, Joyful? Yeah. Question Joyful. mark. <laughs> I mean, it's been a rough two years, so I, it's hard to hard to excavate that adjective. Um, You're doing it though. You're doing a really yeah. <laughs> really good job doing it now. Because why don't we build our societies and our lives around the, the things that do bring us joy? Exactly. Like, we can. We have yeah. the capacity to do so, and it's kind yeah. of silly that we choose not to. Mm-hmm. I know. And I think, you know, the pandemic has opened some avenues to kind of reimagine certain aspects of our lives. And I, it, at least in San Francisco, where um, I used to live, there's a lot of like slow streets or like streets that were shut down for COVID for people to walk yeah. around and enjoy. And like, I really just think that once now that people have seen that, they're like, wait, this street, when you take away the cars is like a hangout area. There's like, open yeah. outdoor seating we can like ride our bikes we can roller sk- like so much joy to be honest and like our mission street one of our main streets in, mm-hmm. in san francisco or sorry valencia street right next to the mission street is closed often and it just feels like a block party all the time and oh. it's my favorite most joyful part of the city right now yeah and i think that i think that's happening in cities all over um the world probably but it's it's cool to see um yes be able to see that you know there is a more joyful option um and it happens to coincide with getting cars out of our cities <laughs> oh, that's really nice yeah. um kind of touching on that you didn't just say joyful when you were uh, talking about climate optimism optimism i believe you also mentioned equity and purpose mm-hmm. which are yeah vibes that I yep. align with. <laughs> and, uh, and I feel like I spent a lot of time thinking about creating a more equitable future or a more purposeful future, at least for myself, more purposeful. Um, but yeah. what did you mean when you were writing that? Yeah, um, I mean, to me, equitable and I think the full sense of the word, um, to, to me, like a more fair society is a more joyful society. And if we want to stick with the theme of cars, for instance, if you look in, in America's, I happen to know a lot about cars. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, If you think, stick with the theme of, you know, creating freeways for, um, Mm -hmm. they were intentionally put in usually black and, and underrepresented communities, they would pave freeways right through them, split them up and then leave them to be where all of the air pollution is created, which is why you still see like higher rates of asthma in lower income communities. And so that's just like one example of the ways in which climate change has disproportionately affected certain communities. Um, And so I think in addressing climate change, we also get to undo some of Mm. these ingrained injustices into our system. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I think in, speaking of in San Francisco, like, you know, the fact that there are homeless people or the fact that there is massive wealth inequality in a city, like yeah. degrades the experience of living somewhere for everyone. And, um, I don't want to live in a society like that. <laughs> like I want to yeah. live in a society where people are taken care of. And there's kind of a more, a a larger sense of community. And um, I think that would make living better for everybody. Um, And so, yeah. And then, and then part of that is also just like a sense of justice of, you know, people that have done wrong should make reparations for those wrongs. Um, 
And that I think is a huge conversation in climate change. When you, mm. when you think about who has emitted the most emissions, um, the United States has historically emitted yeah. the most out of any country. Oh no, you're um, talking about us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and so it's like, it gets simplified into like the global North has created the largest problems and the people that will suffer most are the global South um, is, is usually the people that have contributed the least to the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I think anyone with any sense of justice, like understands that that's not right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I think, yeah, there's, there's a part, and maybe that's where I think purpose comes in where you get to feel like, you know, I, I'm fighting for justice is a very purposeful, um, feeling. Um, but I also just coincidentally came across this study about, um, it was surveying freshman college students and I asked okay. them like what they found to be the most essential. And in the 1970s, it was like developing a meaningful philosophy of life. And like, that was 80% of people really? were like, like, that's the most essential thing. And then 40% of people were like being very well off financially. Okay. And then by 2000s, those had completely flipped where like people's purpose is to be very well off financially yeah. and developing a meaningful philosophy of life was like less than half eh. of people, people were inter interested in that, you know? Um, and I'm Weird. Like, well, yeah, like that seems like a no brainer to just be like, sure. Yeah, that's great. Like that's essential to have a idea of what purpose is in my life. Yeah. Um, and so I think that just kind of shows that wealth and capital has kind of become our culture's like most important thing um which has mm -hmm. has caused all sorts of these same problems um at the expense of a meaningful and purposeful life so i think wow. maybe re flipping those those things back could could be helpful <laughs> okay well we did not have dismantling capitalism <laughs> on our outline but we will take a quick coffee break mm -hmm. and that's what we talk about when we get Perfect. back that's what we talk about <laughs> be right back okay we are back with dr spencer scott uh biologist activist writer farmer still question mark we haven't <laughs> talked about that but i think there's room at the end even in the coffee break, we didn't talk about the farm, which uh, I intended to do, but just didn't get to. Mm -hmm. So uh, next, we're going to talk about all of the bad news that we get when it comes to climate change. And, uh, you know, I did feel very attacked by this. Um, <laughs> our reaction to it, which can include uh, dissociation, distraction seeking, and... Uh, outrage fatigue and i was like okay i have all of those i i do all of these things i have all of these things like <laughs> if it me were a too. meme on instagram i'm like it me <laughs> yeah oh uh, yeah so what's like what why why can't i dissociate why can't i distraction seek what's wrong with those i mean <laughs> doctor if you need to if you need to go for it um i honestly i just think it was a really interesting part of my transition through climate um it's kind of like the the stages of grief a little mm. bit um and i think that you know dissociation is part um denial but not really it's it's anyway it's it's a whole process and i and i felt it in myself and i still mm. feel it all the time um and i think the things that i've learned by listening to much wiser people than me in this space um has been kind of like the result is that hope is a verb essentially. And this is something that like Mary Hegler talks about who I love in the climate space and Rebecca Solnit and um, some other amazing climate people. But basically you don't really get to, you know, sit on the sidelines and mm -hmm. wait for hope to figure everything else out. And just like within your own personal story, you will start to feel better if you can feel like you're having agency over something that is making a difference. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, maybe going back to disassociation, um, you know, it's really interesting as coming from like pure like science and then moving into climate space, like the diversity of topics that 
are very sure. relevant and sure. i'm like yeah. everything's not... falling apart <laughs> yeah everything's falling apart. I, I need to like understand how humans make behavior change i need to understand like how how to i don't know be okay and and move through despair and like all of these yeah. emotional things and i think i was i was talking to my therapist who's almost like a climate specific therapist and i was like i was like what is oh my god what a lucrative career i know <laughs> I, know. I was like, what is disassociation? And, and she basically was just like, it's kind of a fight or flight response. And it's, mm. it's basically a flight response to being like, it's painful in my current situation, like to inhabit this body and to inhabit this space I'm in in this world is, is painful. Mm. And so we, we look to things that will be a solve to that. And, and often that will be like, I'm going to go binge Squid Game, which honestly worth it. And, I haven't and, seen it. Oh, okay. Amazing. <laughs> okay. And um, I don't know. And, and other things that just like get us out of that mindset because it, it's so much. And I think maybe there's there's something in there then to like not put all the weight on yourself. Um, this okay. isn't about like individuals um, are imperfect and it's all your fault and blah, 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 blah. Like, this is a, a system that obviously is mm. broken. And I think that the hope comes in when you kind of can like band together with other like-minded humans and start trying to create an alternative um, and start identifying ways in which you can uh, change the narrative and do good. And I think it's okay to every now and again be like, you know what? I need a break. <laughs> Rest okay. is amazing. Yeah. Um, what I'm kind of, what I was hoping to hear. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. is that maybe dissociation, distraction uh, would be long-term strategies that would help us get out of this climate catastrophe. And it sounds like those are not the way <laughs> to, to get through yeah, the dark I mean, times, unfortunately. Like, yeah. We're not going to get to a solution through a, um, an Avoiding intentional it. practice of dissociation yeah. Yeah. and distraction yeah. seeking. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I guess that's, that's tough love, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think that there there is some maybe some tough love there that I'm like, I, I feel like I'm not ready to to fully dispense like i'm not mm. confident enough in it and but i think that that's right and i think that ultimately what i'm trying to do just in my own life is to resist that and to stay in the flow of of change and yeah. and trying to have an impact on that um and i think if i put too much pressure on myself then that's what will cause me to go backwards into um, uh -huh. av avoidance, you know? And so sure. I think that there's like an, a, a nice line to ride there. Um, because I think in the in the climate space, a lot of people talk about like whatever will keep you in this fight for the long haul. So yeah. you think about longevity in this fight. And so um, in fight, I don't know, in this effort to create a better future. Um, sure. Yeah, and Fight so I future. think I'm into it. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that can include what we can just call rest instead of disassociation or or um, distraction seeking. You know, like you've earned it. Whatever, whatever's going to keep you healthy, and I think it's up to you to that, identify like when it's healthy and when it's unhealthy. Hmm. Okay, yeah. this is a more mature approach, <laughs> and I think a lot of people take, which is great. I think that's yeah. you know something that people like about podcasts so yeah. i appreciate it um i will say that in a um, conversation about hope you also yeah. mentioned change and so as yeah. a politician you said mm -hmm. hope and change yeah. um <laughs> <laughs> so on your on your bingo card you can check yeah it double out. bingo um I and mean, specifically i think you said that hope is not or hope is a verb yeah right uh, and I remember when you said that before, I was like, okay, well, yeah, like running is a verb. So I can run <laughs> to the store or I can run a marathon. And, you know, one of those things I can do several times a day. And mm -hmm. one of those things I have no intention of yeah. ever doing. And mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I feel as though you've got like that marathon endurance in you 
Spencer to where oh. you can go like the long haul with hope. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to give you five minutes of hope and then I'm going to get a cookie <laughs> and then I'm going to uh, give you another five more minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that. I, I don't know. I think that's, that's an interesting challenge because I also, as a biologist and as an ecologist, I keep thinking about, you know, like everyone has a different role to play. Yeah. You know, and so I think we often project that like people need to function how I function because that's what I know. Um, and so, yeah, maybe I don't, maybe your gift is to just sprint really hard and then and be super hopeful for a couple of months and help a lot of people and then burn out. <laughs> <laughs> Crash and burn. That's your, that's your gift. No, I but then know. you get back up. But you get yeah, back yeah. up. <laughs> Do it all over again. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Um, but yeah, and and I think well, maybe, yeah, hope is a verb is like a catchy phrase, but it's also like hope is a practice, perhaps, which is something that right. you build up over time through attempting um, to make change. And, and I think the more you try uh, to enter the space, yeah, you really, the more you realize like how difficult it is to, to change any, anything. I'm mm -hmm. sure you understand that being in politics, um, which is something that I'm like, I need to learn more about that space. Because oh, really? It, yeah. I just think that obviously politics is, you know, how we organize um, and how we, kind of can create the future. Oh, you came to the right yeah. place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I have tons to learn in that space. Um, and oh, happy to I'm sure that politics itself is a, is a marathon, especially if you're on the side of, of trying to make substantive change towards equality instead of just like taking money from a coal, coal company. Oh yeah, <clears throat> to hold everything up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, lesson number one then, um, and regarding politics, start crazy local. Just yeah. find the most local office and uh, identify with that person. You'll realize they're human, um, and then work your way up. And yeah. uh, I think you'll find that people are really receptive to. Mm -hmm. Uh, adjusting the way that they are doing things within the system, their role in the system, when you approach them just as people with the uh, with the opportunity and capacity to do a little bit of good. Yeah. Um, especially, going back to optimism, especially yeah. in these crazy dark times when everything is wrong, you're, you're like, listen, here's one thing you can do for 50 bucks that will yeah. make life better for, you know, one to 1,000 people. Yeah. Activate. All you have to do is activate. Uh, they love that. Amazing. Yeah, I really love that advice. And that's something that we've been actively pursuing here. We moved to a, a new place um, a year and a half ago. And, and that's been... The farm. Yes, yeah, the farm. The farm. <laughs> <laughs> it's trying not to mention. No, <laughs> just this place. Um, and I think getting involved with our local community and particularly our local politics has been kind of like we're building our way up to, to yeah. figuring out right now we're kind of focused on meeting our community and, and understanding the people um, around us. And then um, before we want to try to yeah, say, yeah, here's yeah. what needs to change in this place. I just try to. a neighborhood <laughs> association. Yeah. Those are really good. Mm -hmm. um, I don't usually recommend next door, but you can just like, see I observe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any way that we're any place where the community kind of comes together. Um, mm -hmm. In a smaller town, a lot of times there are these uh, like little festivals mm -hmm. and parties and what have you, and find the organizers of those events because they usually know what's up. Um, you if you have a local if you have a local paper, it's usually just owned by like one or two people, and you can just meet them for coffee. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. This is amazing advice. Thank you so much. It's no problem at all. <laughs> this is what I do. It is what I do. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, okay, but let's let's go back to the future um, and talk about. I'm gonna laugh at my own joke. Yeah. And just go talk about futurism. Talking about how um, when we talk about people making change, 
uh, one message that I think gets maybe lost in translation is that I'm not necessarily talking about getting a lot of people to recycle or getting a lot of people to like, oh, to, to use their masks multiple times, mm -hmm. right? I think mm -hmm. the message is to get people, uh, a lot of people to adjust their system just a little bit uh, so that it's more sustainable. Yeah. And for me, one thing that motivates me is thinking about like, okay, if I do this right, like I'm, okay, adjust. So I live in an old house. We just moved. This is the first podcast conversation in this house. Wow. Um, it's like 110 years old or so. And so wow. everything's a mess. It's a hot <laughs> damn mess. <laughs> and like this room in particular, um, I learned a little bit about foundations. Uh, there's an, like a full foundation behind this room. And then underneath here is a crawl space instead Got of it. the full foundation. And so mm -hmm. this being Minnesota, this room is called AF. Uh, and so uh, I said, husband, I want a space heater. And he said, Jerome, those are not efficient. And no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in the future, in the super long term, if we just adjust the foundation under this room, then it'll be uh, more insulated. It'll be warmer in the winter and cooler in the uh, warmer months. And over the life of of this house, which will hopefully be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, things will be better. And that's yeah. just like a small thing that I can do. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if a lot of people are thinking that way. And so yeah. in, you know, 10 minutes or less, how do you solve that problem? Dr. Scott? All right. So here we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You know what? That's been something that's super fascinating as a new homeowner. And um, I just, my partner, and I just took this permaculture class and permaculture is really, it's more than just gardening. It's about the, the concept or the mental framework of hmm. planning for the future. It's trying to create a permanent culture so it's basically like, oh my God, I am so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Permaculture is permaculture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's oh. a whole mindset of a, like, how do we build houses such that they take advantage of, you know, natural resources so that you need to use the least amount of them. Sun being such an important one or like warmth or temperature control. Yeah. Um, and for instance, like the house we moved into the people that built it clearly like didn't care about um, passive solar heating. Um, mm -hmm. Where like normally if you do, you have your house face the south and then you yeah. have some overhanging windows because the south means it'll be warm in the winter and then the overhanging whatever veranda or whatever is going to protect you from the summer sun. Mm -hmm. And like that allows you to not use a lot of heating to heat your home. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, most houses are not built that way um in america at least and and so it's just like that's one small example of ways in which we kind of just like here's what we want and we're going to pop it down and not think about how to be yeah. efficient and how to you know use the least amount of resources we're we're just like what's easiest and the shortest distance to what i want hmm. um and so i think that's been really really interesting um owning home because we did we did the same thing last year oh. we we got uh space heaters and oh, got the yeah. don't tell my husband i know, I know. <laughs> and we got the electric bill like months later and it was like a thousand dollars <laughs> it was insane it was so how many space only, heaters did you <laughs> I think like three and like one of our, our house, we live with five, there's five of us that live here. And like oh, one oh, of oh. our housemates um, just would like had it on 24 seven in the room and we're like, oh, okay. These are, <laughs> these are not the solution. Um, then we found out we had central heating, which we didn't know we had. So. What? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Surprise. <laughs> yeah. Just never went in the basement. Had no idea. Yeah. Yeah, no. Um, and so, I mean, but yeah, to your point, like insulation, another big, like unglamorous, unsexy thing. Oh, yeah. 
which oh, yeah. like I think is ultimately what why like policy probably needs to solve these things. Um, even though like doing all of these things will save you money. Mm -hmm. um, and but at the same time, you're like, I don't want to spend money to seal my window better because um, that's now and the, my savings are over the next 10, 20 years. And like, that's hard to process. And, yeah, it's and not I'm, Instagrammable, but it's exactly, something you should exactly. do. <laughs> you know what? Maybe that is um, a future career, just like sexy insulation. Redo. Do what you need to do. Do it for yeah. the people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If it, make it Instagrammable and maybe we can solve climate change. I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a different conversation because they could just do that. They could like, yeah. <laughs> they, they could code <laughs> that into being um, and they just don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally, that's... totally different frustration. <laughs> um, we did a social media episode. I think it's episode five. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> that was more like anxiety yeah. around that. Mm -hmm. no matter yeah well I what are the... so what are some like what are things that you do okay so you use this you oh. switched from space heaters to mm -hmm. central air or central well, yeah. heat like do yeah, you do and... other things for the future permaculture yeah. wise or or what yes absolutely and, and that's what we're focused on on the farm yeah. um yes. and so that's been the whole process is basically we've inherited this space that was before us or immediately before us a horse property um and so it was mostly like a big sandy arena and a bunch of weeds oh. that have been compacted by horses and so okay. we um i think a lot about going to other places where people have like trees that have been planted there generations ago and i'm like that is so yeah. sweet and yeah. i think we're starting from zero and so we are planting fruit trees and nut trees and and all sorts of things this winter and oh, like play. we're like our children and grandchildren are really the ones that are going to be benefiting from this. Um, and so that's kind of like where, what we're thinking about is, is these very like long-term 30 to hundred year projects. Yeah. Um, and the same is true as we have a redwood forest is part of our land and cool. Um, and we're, we're learning how to manage that so that it, it stays healthy and, um, one of one of the things is like allowing water to absorb better so that the trees can stay wet during their dry season um so that's like all land-based stuff that we're working on yeah, um good stewardship yeah yeah and i think that's something that we're really really focused on um and then i think um you know there's there's all of like the thing like the advice i can get you on how to lower your carbon footprint which are all important things that are for um future generations um and you know like like don't that, get on a spaceship yeah, <laughs> yeah. Don't, <laughs> don't fly yourself to <laughs> low orbit what um, if it's for 45 seconds though <laughs> <laughs> Impre i'm impressed no um <laughs> But yeah, no, I just think that the the mindset is what I really like to focus on and mm. and and think about and talk about, um, which is, you know, our American culture is very focused on individuals um, and what you can accomplish in your own life lifetime. There's a little yeah. bit of like an individual legacy component where people are concerned with like how I'll be remembered. Yeah, it's um, kind of gross think, though, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> it's still about them while they're alive. And it's I think- It's about my bloodline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, oh. Yeah, and I think, I just really like the concept that we're, we're, we're temporary stewards of wherever we are for the next generations. Yeah. And I think that that, if you can find meaning and purpose in that, that really changes your motivation and, and what you do and why you do it. Um, and I just think that it's like a healthier, and yeah, and that kind of goes back to our conversation of a more joyful and more purposeful life. And like, yeah, I think since adopting or trying to unroot myself from a, the previous mentality where I, I just wanted to succeed and, and win the capitalist game. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. I think, I think making, making towards like a multiple generation thinking has really just changed me in a lot of ways that I, I enjoy. And I think it's, it's kind of nice. So can recommend. 
Okay, well, uh, I, I have to say it do take money to save the earth. And so yeah. um, yeah. we're going to take, take a cough break. Mm -hmm. But then I want to spend some time when we get back talking about ways that we can support you, support the farm, or what have you. Sound good? Yep. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. BRB. We are back uh, with Dr. Spencer Scott, writer, mm, 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 activist, mm. biologist, farmer, uh, literally taught us the meaning of permaculture today. <laughs> Very useful. <laughs> Don't know how that one got by me, but it yeah. did. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I started this podcast, it was fresh off of uh, my unsuccessful campaign. And one of the reasons why I was like, well, let me make sure I'm always asking for money on this thing is because I'm terrible at fundraising. I was like, I just don't mm. want to do it. I don't yeah. like it. Money's gross. Um, yeah. And so it was true. And a lot of the people I think that uh, come onto this platform feel the same way. And so this is kind yeah. of like a, a good moment for you to practice your pitch because everyone here is willing to give. Yes. Oh. Um, so what is something that someone listening can do to support you, Spencer? I mean, first of all, thank you so much. I, that is exactly my problem. I hate fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think non-monetarily, if you want to follow me on Instagram, spencer.r.scott or solarpunk farms, um, that's wonderful. And the other thing is I do have a Patreon um, and you can become a patron for as little as $1 a month. I have kind of a sliding scale you know, pay what, whatever you can afford, whatever feels valuable to you. Um, that has actually been really, really helpful. Um, and something that has made me feel really good that people want to support me. So if you want to be part of that, I would be so happy and, um, grateful. Oh, that's really good. So I, um, yeah. I chipped in for the $1 one. And so I get the Wonderful. newsletter. Yeah. Um, that you maybe alluded to before, and it's 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 a nice newsletter. Thank I like you. it. Yeah, yeah. It, it gets I get like a little email update whenever you <laughs> uh, either publish or update something you've already done, which I thought was cute. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and it's actually it's all publicly available the newsletter, um, and so the 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 payment is really like you are supporting my ability to keep doing my work generally for free and offering it to other people who may not be able to support me. Um, well, but so you yeah. also get an email to you, which is nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not yeah you don't have to like refresh page. <laughs> so much less clicking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think also like if you're interested in supporting climate in general, um, mm. some advice for, for you is, is probably to join um, a climate group, a local climate group, and just to talk to, to friends and family around you about it, you know? And something I'm really interested in um, mm -hmm. is making like climate action aspirational. Um, we were talking about, you know, making insulation sexy, yeah. you know, <laughs> is, is to make um, culturally this uh, an aspirational thing that we can all do together and, and um, make it the new norm so oh, any okay country, i'm interested any, yeah yeah so that's where those are the ways okay yeah <laughs> i'm like wait no the conversation can't be over i want to hear more about the aspiration <laughs> okay <laughs> i just i mean i per, you know we were talking about how i i don't know enough about politics and and you know because it has so much power but i i also think that politics is shaped by culture Mm -hmm. um, and e economics is kind of, they're all kind of shaped by each other in, in, in interesting ways. And I think one thing a lot of people have agency over is culture and what you support and what you find um, aspirational, you know, what you like on Instagram, what you yeah. share with your friends. And I think together that's probably our, our best, or not maybe our best, but like our easiest access point to making a difference is, is changing the narrative. Um, and changing what we culturally find interesting or um, valuable. So one last yeah. little yeah. tidbit. <laughs> Thank you for the tidbit. Yeah. And it's yeah. uh, very reaffirming. 
I think mm-hmm. for me, because, you know, this uh, it was campaign podcast and now it's also a TV show. Wow. And uh, as executive producer, wow. I get to decide <laughs> what we put on there. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I, I feel as though a sustainability um, episode or maybe even another show, who we'll see. Yeah, um, lovely. Could help, I don't know, change minds, change hearts, change minds, give hope. Exactly. All of those. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you got the tagline already. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this has been really great. This is um, so fun. It's super fun. I think it's rare for me. I'm out of focus on my thing. It's rare for me to be like, okay, I still have more to talk about, but I have to go. Usually mm. I'm like, all right, it's been, been an hour. <laughs> ah, I got stuff to do. <laughs> this has been really, really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This has been really fun. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And if I can find a way to drag you back and talk more about your farm, I'm going to do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy <laughs> to be on your TV show. Ooh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. See Bye. you next time. <laughs> you are invited to this show.